If you're aware of Marvel Comics or just Spider-Man comics in general, then you might have heard about a little comic series called Ultimate Spider-Man. When I look back and reminisce on my favorite comics, three usually come to my mind. Batman The Long Halloween, Kingdom Come, and Ultimate Spider-Man. Through Marvel's vast and never-ending catalog of Spider-Man comics, most fans would say that Spider-Man has one of the best consistently good comic runs of all time. And if you were to ask me which one of these comics resonated with me and impacted my life the most, I'd have to say Ultimate Spider-Man. It had everything down to the T. Great character dynamics, amazing original stories, and was completely separate from the main 616 timeline, which made things a lot better and more convenient. Some, or actually most, would say if it wasn't for Ultimate Spider-Man, then we wouldn't have a lot of the iconic Spider-Man movies that we've had recently. But you might ask me, well, why? I'm here to explain how Ultimate Spider-Man saved the Spider-Man franchise. Ultimate Spider-Man is a comic line created by Brian Michael Bendis and Mark Bagley with the intention to remodernize Spider-Man because fans weren't happy with how corny Spider-Man comics were becoming or just Marvel Comics in general. Bad dialogue was becoming a norm in Marvel Comics and sales were just plummeting, causing a lot of outrage and DC was easily beating Marvel in the comics division due to stories like the death of Superman and Nightfall, which catapulted DC's success to new heights and Marvel was just slipping into the depths of despair until Bendis launched Ultimate Spider-Man. And he intended to make this version of Spider-Man more realistic and based on our real world. This is depicted through character dynamics and makes us as a reader go from hating a character to loving them unconditionally, which aligned with how Stan Lee and Jack Kirby wrote him in the first place. And in Ultimate Spider-Man, we have things like Aunt May pulling out a gun on Eddie Brock to protect Peter, Wolverine having a crush on Mary Jane Watson. Weird, buddy. You're weird! And the literal death of Spider-Man, which we'll get to later on. Alongside this, Bendis was able to use realism to make Peter and other characters more compelling. And once Ultimate Spider-Man was created, it inspired Sam Raimi's movies and a whole lot of other Spider-Man stories after. In this run, Peter really felt like a teenager and has been through normal teenager things that you would think about, like being insecure about himself, skipping class, and dealing with the consequences of having to balance a superhero life with a relationship, all which make him grow as a character. There are many heroic moments in Peter Parker's life, such as when he runs directly into danger, when he appears as Spider-Man for the first time to fight the Green Goblin, even though he literally gets beat to a pulp. Like, no, he literally gets rocked. Like, I'm not even like, I'm not even joking. He literally gets rocked. I think that's what's so interesting about his character here. He doesn't win most of his battles, but he has to overcome the steps that stand in his way to get through so that he can persevere. You might have also heard this very similarly in my please stop writing your characters like this video and my why the Joker is the perfect antagonist video. Characters having to endure mental conflict to make them better people all around and more prepared for their battle develops their character and it makes them more compelling. In pursuit of justice, Peter will go to any length and puts his ideals of truth and justice at all odds against any of his villains in order for him to achieve it. Prime example, the Kingpin. He doesn't stand for injustice at all and this defines Peter's character. He really feels like a hero here. This version of Peter is less likable than his original 616 counterpart due to his lack of interest and respect for his peers. But off rip when Peter becomes Spider-Man, he alerts MJ and tells her he's Spider-Man and she helps cover it up. Because of this, Peter has to sacrifice a lot of things in his life like his grades, which continue to fall, and his relationships around him, which continue to deteriorate. But he doesn't give up being Spider-Man because he knows that him being Spider-Man is the right thing to do. He feels like being Spider-Man is something that the Sooty needs and that he needs to do, even if it's something that he doesn't want to do. When he's not Spider-Man, he still cares about the people around him and he tries to be as supportive as he can. But, well, besides MJ, he's too scared to tell anyone else about his Spider-Man gig. Peter's actions drive the development of most characters and once MJ and Peter began dating, it's a very on and off thing and being Spider-Man affects it hugely. She doesn't like how Spider-Man is affecting his life and she doesn't want to have to go to sleep thinking of the potential possibility that Peter might die. But the effects of losing Uncle Ben makes Peter and Aunt May better people once they resolve their issues. And he starts to sort out his problems with MJ and makes new friends. No moment in this comic though feels rushed howsoever because every character develops at a realistic rate. And this comic is an outlier to my opinion that slow pacing 
pacing is overall bad for any story because despite its slow pacing the characters are still interesting and it doesn't really affect the story hugely if the pacing is slow at all it actually gives us more time to actually comprehend what's going on unlike other comics this proves my point earlier that relatability is crucial and this is done with villain like characteristics green goblin and other villains are given the respect that they deserve and they're depicted as real threats and not just comedic relief. Norman Osborn is the creator of the spiders that gave Peter his powers and wants to experiment on him, but can't, so he threatens to kill him. In my earlier description of Peter's mental conflict, I said that most of his emotional conflict stemmed from losing battles to villains like Norman. It's not just because he lost the actual battle, but because Norman is his best friend's dad. Norman is the exact opposite of Peter and basically the polar opposite of his philosophy, which is fitting for a villain slash hero dynamic. We've seen this with characters like Batman and the Joker, the Flash and the Reverse Flash, and lastly, Goku and Frieza. Villains need to be strong antagonists for their hero. We as an audience should be able to relate to them in some sort of way because it increases interest in that villain, which leads us to feel sympathetic towards that character and empathize with them. A large part of this relatability can be attributed to his main intent. This is to embarrass Peter and show the world that they can't put their trust in him to protect them forever. He wants to convince all of them that they're living a lie and all heroes are weak. And he also feels like since Spider-Man basically was created due to his invention, he is rightfully his property and should obey what he says. Dialogue feels very real in these type of stories, and if you watch my Justice League War video, then you know how much I need subtext when I'm reading or watching something. Characters who say things like, I admire your commitment to each other, it's a beautiful thing. The last is something I'll never have. After thousands of years of living, you don't seem to know who the hell you are. Are not written well. We get better dialogue here, and it's what I want, so I get what I want. Another good dynamic that has good dialogue is Eddie and Peter. It feels very real here, and we can see them relating through their father's dynamic. For context, Eddie and Peter discover the symbiote and that their fathers created it. But Eddie tells Peter not to open it, and Peter says yes, he that he won't. But Peter comes back as Spider-Man and steals it. Once this happens, Eddie makes the inductive that Peter is Spider-Man and this ruins their friendship. And now Eddie officially hates Peter. This gives him a pretty reasonable basis to attack. And the thing is that's so cool about Venom is that he's not even necessarily evil. He just has a twisted and unique version of justice that's very different from Peter's we'll say, which makes them clash. Venom and Green Goblin have a consistent impact on Peter's mind, which gives him the confidence to accomplish his mission. Besides Ultimate Spider-Man, there are many more Ultimate comic lines that Michael Bendis worked on, so you would consistently get team-ups with characters like Wolverine or Iron Man, but it would be executed so well because each of the heroes would have to learn how to work together, and this would increase their chemistry so that next time they team up, they can defeat the threat more efficiently. This is a good way to establish your world's world building by hinting at these things when developing these friendships, so when the final threat arrives, all characters are on point and the chemistry is like no other. We see this in movies like Avengers Endgame, of course Infinity War, and even Zack Snyder's Justice League. World building is important because in world building, the writer creates a strong visual and emotional image of their world, where the story takes place, is established by the imaginary world. Your story may be made or broken by it, and that's why your story's world building needs to be a point, literally. This leads me to Ultimatum, which shows all heroes working together to save the cities that have been drowned by Magneto. In this, we see how much of a hero Peter truly is, trying to save as many people as he can. And J. Jonah Jameson is the one to acknowledge this out of all people. Once he finds out Peter is Spider-Man, he swears to keep his secret and tells Peter about his son's death. And this allows us as an audience to emphasize with J. Jonah Jameson. And it backs up my point from earlier that Peter's actions affect the whole story as a whole, which is how a protagonist should affect his story. Since we're on the topic of Ultimate Spider-Man, I thought I should talk about my favorite character in the whole entire comic line. Kitty Pride, and one of my favorite story arts. When Deadpool kidnaps all the X-Men and Spider-Man and puts them on this remote island, once they finally get off the island, there's photos released by paparazzi of Peter and Kitty Pride kissing. And this reveals their relationship to the public, which out of risk for Peter's identity, they keep their distance from each other. Kitty is so cool because of her development after her relationship with Peter. She's depicted to have matured and she starts acting like somewhat as a role model. The character dynamics in Ultimate Spider-Man are just practically the best out of any comic. Honestly, I think Kitty's portrayal is supposed to be a lesson to Peter, who apologizes for messing with her feelings, and he tries his best not to hurt anybody's feelings in the future. This is where his character is redefined. 
In spite of all heroic acts that Peter has performed, he's still an asshole and pretty petty in nature. There's no doubt that he is the depiction of teenage angst. And this takes us to the end. In an effort to defeat Spider-Man once and for all, the Sinister Six learn of Peter's identity and decide to attack his home. Despite already being injured, Peter gets up and decides to fight the Sinister Six, with the exception of Green Goblin. Well, he's able to defeat all of them besides Green Goblin, just to make sure you guys heard me on. A back and forth between Green Goblin and Peter illustrates how far both characters have come. Despite the fact that he's still engaged in combat, Peter continues to protect those that he loves while trying to hold Goblin off at the same time. Goat. Despite Norman's defeat, Peter's wounded by Norman, and he succumbs to his wound. Even I cried when I read this because, I mean, it, it, it's meant to break the audience's heart. It, it, it's written for that reason. And this is exactly why Bendis has been developing these characters. For an amazing payoff like this, showing his writing ability and the ability to make his audience feel what he's trying to convey. Peter's friends gather to remember him and mourn him. And we get to see how much impact Peter had on the people he loved and the world as a whole 